Hey, Adamy from Top Mysteries, and welcome back to the channel. Uh, while researching Noah Donoghue in my previous video, I came across a young man called William Callahan, uh, who this video was supposed to be solely dedicated to discussing. However, after doing some reading on Will, I came across another boy called Luke Shambrook, who disappeared 40 miles away, and uh, some years prior as well. There were a number of odd similarities, as you'll come to see between these two, uh, and to be quite honest with you, these two are very unusual disappearances, and things get pretty bizarre, especially when discussing Luke later on, so do stick around for that. Now with that being said, let's start with Will. So William Callahan was 14 years old at the time of his disappearance, and he went missing in Australia on Mount Disappointment on the 8th of June 2020. William was on the autistic spectrum, and from what I understand, he was completely non-verbal. I used to work a lot with children who had special educational needs, and uh, children with autism is probably who I worked with most frequently, and that's actually why I went to uni in the first place, um, just so I could get a better understanding of it. I don't want to go too in-depth here, but at around William's age, some of the common signs of autism that you can pick up on include things like, um, so you'll be able to see that they have a really hard time understanding what people are thinking or feeling, which you can probably imagine how that makes socialising quite difficult. They can also find it difficult to tell you how they feel themselves, uh, which from experience seems to be worse with boys, uh, because I think guys in general just aren't very good at that in the first place, not to generalise too much. A lot of young people with autism, they might enjoy like a really strict daily routine, and they can become quite upset if there are changes to that. They might have a very keen interest in one topic, and if you give them long enough, they'll become really skilled in that topic. And just as a general rule, they seem to have a, a harder time making friends, and they prefer to be alone. So you can probably see the implications here, but the idea is that William will have been far more vulnerable than an average 14 year old boy. Though of course this would have been highly distressing to anyone disappearing and then finding themselves alone and lost on a mountain. Now, William's disappearance was particularly odd, and we're going to get into why that's the case. There might even be an argument to be made here that both of these disappearances could fall within the missing 411 category. So let's get into it. So William disappeared on the 8th of June of this year, uh, and he was last seen at 20 past two in the afternoon near the summit of Mount Disappointment. William's dad reported that at the time he just ran ahead of him and uh, you know, the dad was obviously following him. It seems as though it just got out of line of sight and uh, when the dad was heading to that location, William wasn't there. So it actually looks like this happened pretty quickly. And my first thoughts were, you know, I was wondering what if this was like a, a, a little prank that had gone wrong, you know? Uh, William was non-verbal, so perhaps he, he was just hiding behind a tree or something like that. But in the end, he ended up uh, getting lost and he was, able, he was unable to reply to any of the calls for him. But after reading more about this, I don't think that's the case at all. Uh, and there's some odd information in here. So he was last seen on the south side of the hiking spot around 37 miles north of Melbourne. And at the time he was wearing a blue hoodie, black tracksuit trousers and his shoes. This was a problem because when the family realized that this was now gonna be a major task in finding him, uh, it was also realized that temperatures were gonna to drop to below freezing that night. And you know, he wasn't dressed for those conditions, so there was an air of urgency here. And that was actually pretty evident too, because the search was organised uh, really quickly after the report was made, and they had helicopters up right away, and before night hit, they already had 100 boots on the ground looking. Which is quite incredible, really. So Inspector Christine Layla was involved with this case, and she said, William doesn't verbalise, so if anyone finds him, the best way to communicate with him is to just be patient and calm with him. William is capable of wandering a fair distance, he does like food and water, and there is a chance that he could go into houses or places to seek those things. Sergeant Greg Paul then followed up with saying that the overnight temperatures were going to present William with life-threatening weather, and he said, we're pulling out everything to find this young fellow. It's very distressing for him and his family. We're hoping that he's hunkered down and he sought what shelter he could overnight and found some insulation, and we're hoping to find him this morning. That following morning, uh, there were around 130 searchers present, and the police vowed that the search would not be called off until he was found. Christine also made it clear that when William wants to communicate with others, he'll, uh, he'll tap his chest, so the searchers were told to just be mindful of that. 
So there was a very obvious concern that William would have suffered from hypothermia overnight because he just wasn't dressed for those conditions. Uh, the other obvious problem was that he didn't have any food or water. And what's confusing here is just how quickly this seemed to take place. You know, he managed to get out of line of sight of his dad and when his dad got to that location, he wasn't there. And from the reporting, it only seems like a very brief period from when uh, William turned the corner and to when his dad then caught up. It's hard to imagine exactly what happened here, but he, maybe he could have seen something that piqued his interest and then wandered away following, you know, whatever he saw, whether it was an animal or, you know, whatever. You know, people with autism are known for becoming fixated on something, so, you know, that could be expected, but it's not clear. I did just want to make it clear as well that in addition to the aerial and man-powered components of the search, they did also have dog squads out as well as bikes out searching in the area. But as you might be familiar with by now if you've been watching this channel a lot, uh, the dogs did not find William scent despite being positioned in the very area that he disappeared from. So on the 9th of June, William's mother, Penny, uh, she'd been speaking to the press and she revealed some key details about William. This is what she said. I'm not really the praying type, but I'm praying now because I want him home. Sometimes being a mum of an autistic child is really tough. I have two boys with autism. Will is my eldest son and would be considered as very low functioning. She then continued, Will had an intellectual disability, but was fairly smart in his own way. He's resilient and very skinny, but eats all the time. If Will had reached an urban environment, he would look out for a place and will likely have his hands over his ears to muffle loud noises. So just before we go any further, I did want to clarify a couple of things. Uh, while Penny said that William was low functioning, it doesn't always mean that a person is low in intelligence. As a general rule of thumb, it means the ability to which a person is able to cope with uh, daily life. So a person who's considered high functioning, you might not even know that they have autism, or it could be very, very subtle. Whereas a person who's low functioning, it's going to be visually obvious to some degree that that's the case and obviously that person then may struggle in daily life. It's also important to note as well that low and high functioning in regards to autism is not an official diagnosis, but seems to be more of a quick and easy way to explain the various levels that we observe. I don't want to dwell on this too much here, but an obvious example would be uh, that a high functioning autistic person will use spoken language and communicate effectively. Uh, in some cases, you might not even be aware of it. Low functioning, on the other hand, uh, as William displays, may use limited, or no spoken language at all. And you know, they might even place a focus on technology or like picture boards to communicate. Now, when Penny states that William has an intellectual disability, but is fairly smart in his own way, it's difficult to really know what that means specifically, you know, in terms of comprehension and just his ability to process information. Uh, but nevertheless, it's important that we keep that in mind. So at this time on the 9th, the search has ramped up and Australia's Seven News stated more than 200 volunteers have joined and about 150 police and emergency services have been looking for William non-stop while temperatures drop below zero. SES Deputy Controller Jerry Connell said it's been a really cold night in really challenging conditions. It's a very unique search for us and probably one of the biggest ones we've done so far. We've been out there with our lights on and we've been playing Thomas the Tank Engine over our PA systems because Will likes Thomas. We've had our lights flashing, our sirens going and we're just there listening. So we're on the 10th at this point and William had spent two nights in the forest alone. Each night the temperature dropped to around freezing and needless to say the authorities were, were becoming very concerned now. The Age newspaper stated that over 450 people ended up searching for William on the 9th uh, but no clues had emerged that day. Penny believed that he would have just gotten immersed in being out there and forgotten where he was. She said, as a young fella, you can't take your eyes off him for too long. He's always been fast. So during the nights of these searches, the authorities had made use of thermal imaging technology, uh, but unfortunately they still hadn't spotted William. Although William would actually be discovered that very day, thankfully alive. So here's what was reported by The Independent. A teenager with non-verbal autism who spent two days lost on a cold mountain in Australia has been found. The 14-year-old was found on the life-threateningly cold mountain on Wednesday, following land and air searches by hundreds of individuals. Local bushman Ben Gibbs, who said he grew up in the area and knows the mountain well, told Australian media that he found William near the summit around midday. He said, I decided to veer off the track near the summit where it becomes a single track. I was just wandering through the bush, it was quite thick, so I was breaking my way through it. 
He was just about 15 meters from me standing there, just really angelic. He was just standing there, standing and looking. Ben then gave William a pair of socks, some chocolate and a jacket before emergency services treated William and took him to hospital. It's not clear at all what happened to his shoes and socks by the way, and he didn't appear to be suffering from hypothermia, which some people did find odd. Both nights were on freezing temperatures and uh, one of the nights was actually the coldest night of the year up to that time. So this was reported by The Guardian. A volunteer described the mood at base camp as absolute jubilation. We just saw Will, he looks in really good shape. He smiled at everyone as he was lifted out of the car. Penny said, I'm really overwhelmed here. He is as well as could be under the circumstances and quite calm considering. So going back to Ben, the man who found him, he said that William looked in reasonable health and that he wasn't shivering too bad. He also said that for some reason he just felt as though he was on the right track to finding William. This is kind of our family mountain. I've been coming here since I was a boy, so I know it really well. William was just shy of a mile away from the staging area, a 10 minute walk off the track in Bushland. William's shoes were found around 100 meters away from the main track. I actually think that was quite odd, because while you might expect the shedding of clothing while experiencing hypothermia, uh, William only seemed to have removed his footwear and, and nothing else at all. Uh, from what I'm reading as well, it doesn't actually appear that he suffered from hypothermia at all. Uh, so I'm not sure why he'd remove his shoes. It's always difficult when you're discussing these kinds of circumstances uh, about someone who has these kinds of developmental disabilities. Um, because while, yeah, it is weird that he would have removed his shoes in, the, in that kind of terrain, uh, it's difficult to understand the thought process. So I've just stopped for a minute and I've done a bit of further reading about the shoes and uh, before William was found, his mother stated that William may be found without footwear in the bush as he doesn't like wearing shoes. So that most certainly could account for that and there's not a lot else I can really say about that then. So once William was reunited with his family, uh, Penny said that he communicated that he felt confused, scared and that his body felt weird. I'm not sure what he meant by that, you know, obviously it'd been very cold, so perhaps that's just what he meant. Again though, it's difficult because uh, we don't know how well William is able to articulate these things to his family. Dr. Danny Bersin examined William at the hospital and said that he's got a couple of abrasions on his feet and one or two on his face or ear, but other than that he's looking pretty good. Dr. Joanne Grindley, uh, she was the Deputy Director of Emergency Medicine at the hospital, uh, she just confirmed that William had managed to avoid hypothermia. Dr. Greenley said that she wasn't really sure how he managed to do that, uh, but she said that probably it's because he's an active young man. Dr. Greenley wasn't the only one surprised about that either. Uh, and ABC News stated that Christine Layla, as well as many rescuers, were surprised about that too. They were dubbing it the miracle survival, and this is what ABC News reported. Rescuers are unsure how exactly William survived in such tough conditions and came through the experience in fairly good condition. Miss Thompson said that paramedics were quite shocked at how good a physical condition William was in. SES officer Jared Bell described William's survival as nothing short of a miracle. I'm glad that I'm not the only one that thought that was weird and it's difficult to explain why that was the case. Jared said, uh, the police were absolutely honest and correct when they said that the weather we're dealing with was deadly weather. How William managed to pull through that weather while only wearing a hoodie and trousers and without shoes at some point is not clear at all. In fact, and this is a little bit odd, uh, but some were speculating that his autism had somehow acted like a superpower, which, you know, uh, I'm not sure how grounded that is. Uh, though some on the spectrum genuinely believe that they possess the ability to stay warm in colder temperatures. Professor Cheryl Disaniak, who is a top professor at Melbourne's Tennyson Autism Research Centre, told the press that no autistic person is the same and the reality is that we will probably never know if or how his condition assisted him. She said, with this case, we just don't know. The bottom line is that he was found. I mean, you know, obviously, yeah, the most important point is that he was found. Uh, but I think the question of how William managed to survive and avoid hypothermia is a very important one. Because obviously, one implication could be that he was in a place of warmth, which then raises all kinds of questions. But, you know, because William isn't able to speak, we'll probably never know what happened or how he managed to stay warm. I found some other odd comments too, and after returning home, his stepfather said this. He went straight through the gate, and the first thing he did was sit down on his swing set and have a big long swing. Will's come out of this experience with a few cuts and bruises on the bottom of his feet, surprisingly few for a kid who wandered around for two days in the freezing cold. 
It's also just important to clarify now that William was with his biological father when he disappeared, not his stepfather. Uh, I was hoping to find some more information in relation to the exact moment William disappeared, but all sources basically report the same thing, that he ended up ahead of the group, got out of line of sight and then disappeared. The way it's written, it seems as though it wasn't for long at all, and then once his father had turned the same corner, he was just gone. Unfortunately, we'll probably never know the specifics as to how he went missing and how he managed to survive and avoid hypothermia. I've done a bit of research on this and it's actually quite surprising. It seems that within the autistic spectrum, around 40% are considered to be non-verbal. Uh, a recent study looked at 535 non-verbal autistic children being the, between the ages of 8 and 17 and it appears that around 47% become fluent speakers in the end, though I'm not sure of the specific ages. So if William is able to gain the ability to speak, uh, I'm sure that he'll have an interesting story to tell. I'm actually looking forward to hearing the discussions as to how he might have avoided hypothermia. Uh, if you spend a lot of time out in like wilderness areas or like mountains, then please do leave your thoughts as well. Because there was no real discussion on that, other than those who found it unusual. You know, I was having a hard time understanding that without suggesting that he may have found uh, a place of warmth. But how would that have been the case on a mountain, uh, where the temperatures are around freezing? I'm not sure, hopefully someone can educate me on that. In the end though, I'm just thankful that it was found okay. Uh, but yeah, do share your thoughts on this one. Now, while researching William's disappearance, I came across another that involved another autistic boy. This occurred around 40 air miles away in the area around Lake Eildon at the Devil's Cove campground. This area is inside the Lake Eildon National Park and it seems that some actually call it the Fraser National Park. I don't know if they're interchangeable, uh, I'm not, not actually sure but I've seen, I've seen it named both and uh, obviously this national park is where the searching took place. I always wonder what happened for it to receive a name like that as well, you know, Devil's Cove. I can't imagine anything good. So Luke Shambrook was 11 years old when this occurred on the 3rd of April 2015. I'm not sure if Luke was completely non-verbal in the same way that William was, but it appears that he had limited speech. So Luke was actually camping with his family at the time and he was spotted leaving the camping grounds alone at 9.30 that morning. Similar to William, we're going to go day by day as the incident was unfolding to paint the best picture as to what happened. So on the 3rd of April of 2015, the ABC News reported this. An 11 year old boy with autism who went missing in central Victorian campground may not know that he's lost, Victoria Police fear. Police, search and rescue volunteers and campers spent today scouring bushland Fraser National Park near Lake Eildon. Sergeant Greg Paul said that unfortunately, Luke might not respond to searches and may not even know that he's lost. He won't necessarily respond to his name, but that might change a little bit as he gets hungry. Where there was a lot of information in regards to William's level of ability, that doesn't appear to be the case here for Luke. So other than Luke having limited speech, I'm not exactly sure where he is other than that. But Greg continued, We honestly don't know what his status is, whether he's curled up and sleeping somewhere, or hiding, or whether he would even necessarily respond to us looking for him. We've got a lot of searches in the bush, and we've got lots of searches searching in between the tracks, in the gullies, and the spares. We've also got people walking the bank of the lake with the possibility that he might have fallen in. We've got boats in the water, and people snorkeling certain areas. Finally, Greg stated that temperatures during the day were warm and overnight it's going to be cold, but not life-threateningly so. So Greg then said, the searches continued on the 4th and they were now joined by an air wing, police and dog squadrons. So in addition to those already present, 100 emergency workers and volunteers had now joined the search effort as well. So it was at this point that it was confirmed that Luke was last seen around the Devil Cove camping area at around half nine in the morning. I actually did have a little look around just to see where that place had that name. Because when a place has that kind of name, uh, it often entails that something bad happened there. But unfortunately, I just couldn't find out why. So Greg came back and told the press that they were now very concerned for Luke's welfare 
and uh, they told people that they're not discounting any possibility and uh, they're throwing an enormous amount of resources at the search. He said, we've got the best searches that we can muster. And he then just said, they're the best in the state, basically. So Greg's previous predictions were correct. And the temperature dropped around 8 degrees Celsius overnight, which is cold, but still considered survivable. The searchers were given the advice to focus on flatter areas, as uh, they were saying that Luke was unlikely to climb the steeper areas. So while they were working overnight, the searchers had lit fires and took bright lights out with them, trying to attract Luke towards them. Uh, the police also had thermal imaging equipped helicopters in the air uh, and they were obviously hoping to spot him. When he disappeared in the first place, he was wearing a black beanie, a black wind cheater, a scarf, dark grey tracksuit trousers and grey boots. On the morning of the 4th, the searchers actually found a black beanie that they thought was Luke's, but the Herald's son reported it was a false alarm, but they didn't specify as to how they knew that. The family did say that uh, while they went from this area, uh, they'd been on several walks with Luke now, and but they weren't sure how much he'd remember of them. They also weren't sure why he'd gone off by himself and said that this was completely out of character for Luke. So on the 5th, a family who were four-wheel driving reported seeing a boy who matched Luke's appearance sitting on a log in the Devil's River vicinity in Fraser National Park. Uh, this sighting was around two and a half miles away from the initial disappearance location. And that's just in air miles, it's actually way further than that if you're wading through, you know, the bushland. But the authorities obviously obviously rushed to that spot, but they couldn't find him. And they'd gotten there quickly as well, but when they realised that they weren't going to be able to locate him, they de deployed a helicopter above them with thermal imaging technology, but they had no luck either. The helicopters were present until late that night, scouring the area of interest, but they just never found a heat signature. I'm not entirely sure how Luke was managing to evade the searches so effectively here, uh, but the authorities were forced to call the search off that night, as no clues were presenting themselves. But they then said that they'd pick up again on the morning of the 6th, and at that point Luke would have been missing for 72 hours. So Sergeant Ralph Willingham of the Victoria Police then made a statement and said that there was no evidence to suggest that anything nefarious had happened here, but rather everything pointed to Luke just simply wandering away from the camping ground, you know, just for some reason. He said, We are turning our mind to other circumstances that may have resulted in his disappearance, but there is nothing at all to indicate that we need to go down that line. It was then reported that Luke is fascinated by the water and repeated that Luke may still not even know that he's lost. So on the 6th, the searchers actually came across Luke's beanie this time, and it was confirmed to be his as well. Uh, and the police said that it was found between Devil's Cove and Candlebark campsites. So at this point now, there were 200 people involved in the search, and there were many more that wanted to get involved, uh, but the authorities told them that uh, having more people now would only complicate matters. It's interesting as well because uh, the police also began to question the sighting near the Devil's River because I can only imagine they'd, they'd done the math and they came to the conclusion that Luke should not have been able to travel that kind of distance alone. And also, you know, with the thermal imaging equipment failing to find him, I can only imagine that brought about some confusion as well. So everyone involved now was becoming particularly worried because the temperatures were reaching lows of like 3 degrees Celsius overnight, which puts him at serious risk of hypothermia. It's also important to say that while the beanie definitely belonged to Luke, they had absolutely no idea why he removed it. Or when. I'd also just like to note as well that the dogs had not found Luke's scent this entire time. So, on the 7th now, there was some brilliant news because this is when Luke was found. Here's what was reported by The Guardian. Victoria Police have released extraordinary footage of the moment 11-year-old Luke Shambrook was found after more than four days missing in dense bushland. Luke, who has autism, was found about 11.55am on Tuesday off Skyline Road, police said. The road is about two miles from the Candlebark campsite where Luke had last been seen by his family on Friday. It was a police helicopter crew that found him and Luke appeared to be sitting on sloped ground with his legs extended out in front of him. Luke was found to be suffering from exhaustion, hypothermia and dehydration. Sergeant Brad Pascoe was the officer who saw Luke from the helicopter. He said, just out of the corner of my eye, I caught a little flash of something. It wasn't much, but it was enough to make me get the guys to turn the aircraft around and to have a further look. As we got closer and were able to have a better look at him, we saw that it was a person on the ground and we were able to train the camera in and confirm that it was actually Luke. When searchers reached Luke, they said he was unable to communicate, but he drank the water and ate the bread that was offered. This part is kind of odd, but the article describes that Luke had somehow managed to climb over a number of large, steep rocks to get to his final position in the dense scrub. 
They then state that because Luke's speech was limited, we may never know the full details of what transpired here. And despite this entire ordeal, uh, Luke is able to walk out of the bush with the rescuers on his own two feet. Acting Commander Rick Nugent said Luke is fantastic for what he's been through, suffering exhaustion of course, dehydrated and some hypothermia, but from where he's been, four nights and four days in the bush, he's really in remarkable condition. In some ways, it's a miracle. You will have seen all the terrain here, how thick it is, how it's been during the nights. It was also revealed that helicopters had previously been over this area, but had failed to see him. The Age newspaper gave some more details on Luke's condition, uh, and they said that he did not appear to have sustained any injuries. So, I was a bit confused now, because the authorities earlier said that it was unlikely that Luke could have made it to Devil's River alone, and now he was found a similar distance away near Skyline Road. So I was wondering if that made the earlier sighting plausible of it actually being Luke. I'm not actually sure about that, but the search has completely failed. And then they said that it was very improbable that Luke could have made it to the river alone. So why is no one questioning how he made it near Skyline Road alone? I think that there's just so much jubilation when they're missing a found that little details like that are kind of tossed aside. And by the way, when we're talking about Skyline Road being two miles away from uh, Devil's Cove, that's air miles. I'd need someone more experienced in these areas to educate me here, but I can tell you for a fact that in such harsh terrain, it is far more than two miles away if you're walking on foot. Is anyone else finding that a little bit odd? Or am I just completely underestimating Luke here? We'll probably never actually know the specifics here because of his limited speech. You know, I'd, I'd love to hear why he left by himself in the first place and then how he managed to travel these kinds of distances without getting injured and evading the searches the entire time. So I've just had another look and I actually feel like I'm going a bit crazy now because I just can't find anyone questioning how we travel to that location. How on the one hand can you hold the position that it's unlikely that he reached uh, the Devil's River by himself, but then not question how he made it to the Skyline Road area by himself? So the Age newspaper actually got it wrong now because they said he was spotted sitting on the side of a hill by a police helicopter, not far from where his black beanie had been found in the area on Monday afternoon. And from what I'm seeing, they were the only ones that reported it that way. Everyone else had stated that it was found near the Skyline Road area, including the police. You know, the quote by the police stated that it was found two miles away from where he vanished. So I think we can completely disregard the age here, because the area where the beanie was found was not two miles away. It just goes to show that some of the reporting out there isn't so great and you've really got to vet this stuff, you know? And what's funny is, in the next article by The Age, they actually contradicted themselves and stated that they found him near the Skyline Road area, specifically at the Offerius Spare, which seems to be just slightly north or east of the road, depending on where you are on the road. So at this point, I came across another article in which uh, medical experts were stunned at Luke's condition and survival, uh, and that reminded me of William a little bit, actually. The title of this article is Luke Shambrook's survival in rugged bushland near Lake Aildon is remarkable, say medical experts. Here's what they had to say. Luke Shambrook has been visited in the Royal Children's Hospital by two of his rescuers as doctors marvel at the boy's bushland survival. The 11-year-old will likely stay another night in hospital where he is in stable condition, being treated for dehydration and exhaustion. Luke's parents remain by his bedside, with his treating paediatrician exclaiming that the boy was in a better condition to what she expected. Dr Amy Gray stated this, I don't know that any one of us know exactly what he's been through, but I think for all of us, we think he's doing absolutely fabulously for someone who has been through what we can only imagine and certainly in better condition than what we'd expect. Aside from the dehydration, he's tired and weak, but there's no other real physical issues at this stage. Luke has been unable to shed much light on his time in the bush and was unaware whether he had eaten or drank anything over the four days he was missing at Lake Eildon. Other medical experts in the hospital were also hailing Luke's survival as remarkable and to some degree must have been having a difficult time in explaining just why he was in such good condition. The Director of Emergency Medicine at the Royal Melbourne Hospital, Professor George Breitberg, was shocked at Luke's condition, saying that he'd been very lucky. So he said, without food or water for five days, you would expect him to be very weak and unable to walk or stand. Certainly, you can go without food for that period. Water is more problematic though, because if we go without fluid for a long period of time, the body tries to conserve fluid by shutting down the kidneys and you stop passing urine and you stop sweating. You start to become disorientated, confused, and eventually you will go into a coma. There's also the exacerbation to think about. If he's been on the move or climbing, it's just a lot of muscle activity, and all those things could require more utilization of energy and substances, more food and water. 
you know, and that's certainly it, because he must have been using a lot of energy travelling from point A to B, you know, given that the distance is two air miles. And again, I'm not sure how much that would have been on foot in rugged and harsh terrain, but I'm pretty sure it's considerably more than two, because you can't travel in a nice straight line. So the doctors also said that it's remarkable because Luke's autism will have made survival particularly extraordinary here because he may not have been able to identify the dangers and hazards in the wilderness, especially at night. I found this interesting too. Severe hypothermia was another threat, but it appeared Luke was able to keep himself warm enough that he didn't suffer from the worst of it. Rick Nugent followed up by saying um, he wasn't sure we'll ever know what happened to Luke and just how he managed to survive. His parents did say that he likes to hide, so perhaps that helped him to some degree here. Though his parents, just like everybody else, were absolutely shocked that he made it through this. You know, and they're the people that know him better than anyone else, so I think their word carries a lot of weight. So this is what his mother had to say. We found it difficult to keep our hopes up. To have such an amazing outcome, it's hard to express it in words. If only we could have a snapshot of what his time out there in the bush was like. The concept of trying to understand what he did and how he survived is beyond what we can imagine. We'd like to have a glimpse at what he did at night. So they then went on and thanked everyone for their prayers and that maybe that helped him somehow. Uh, it seems clear to me that the parents are at a complete loss as to what happened here. Uh, what's interesting is that everybody is saying just how remarkable it is that he managed to get through this and there was a lot of surprise shown at the distance he travelled as well. But there isn't a lot of questioning going on. Just off the top of my head, I think some valid questions might be, was he alone the entire time? How did he manage to keep warm? What was he doing overnight exactly? Was he eating and drinking? You know, he must surely have been drinking during this time. And why did the dog searches completely fail? Why couldn't they find his scent? I'm sure there are many more questions here that you could pose, but you catch my drift. So there was a further update on the 18th of April, where his mother conveyed that Luke was unable to tell them what went on out there in the bush. She said, He understands much more than he's able to express, but it's unlikely that we will ever be able to piece together all of what happened. It was then estimated that he travelled around 12 and a half miles, or more, in this harsh terrain. To travel that kind of distance, the parents said that it must mean that he barely slept at all during the missing five days, otherwise you can't account for that kind of movement. So there were no further updates now until the 14th of June 2015, uh, and it seems now that the parents started to have some questions about what happened. This was reported by the Herald Sun. The 12 year old's family still don't know what he endured during those five days wandering Lake Eildon National Park, surviving without food or water in temperatures of 6 degrees Celsius, wearing little more than grey tracksuit pants and a black wind cheetah. So get this as well. Luke's reaction to the trees gives the only insight to what he went through in those missing days. He looks up at the towering branches, mouth agape, and ignores encouraging calls to walk on, and it's not the first time. In the weeks after Luke was incredibly found alive five days and four nights lost in the dense bush, his teacher saw him crying. He was standing outside, staring at a cluster of trees. And it was a similar story a few weeks ago, when he abruptly ran from the trees that circled a 3D maze at Arthur's seat. His parents then say that he will stand, planted in place, and stare at the tops of the trees. His mother reiterated, I can't get around what he did at night, I just want to know what he did at night. She also said that when Luke would see them looking at pictures or videos surrounding Luke's search, he would urge them to stop and log off. So doctors were quoted as saying, This boy hasn't just walked two miles. His injuries are similar to a marathon runner. Sergeant Paul said, There are people who pass away after only one day in the bush, yet wet and in the wind, there he was on day five. Whenever Luke is near trees, he will hold onto his father's hand tightly, and once they pass, he eases up again, but he will look around and quiz his surroundings. Now just to make things even weirder, I did find mention of another autistic boy called Paddy Hindlebrand, who was 9 years old and disappeared around 100 miles away from Luke in 1987. You know, they said that it holds some similarities to Luke's disappearance, in that they found his hat, only they never found Paddy. Unfortunately though, I just don't have enough time to research another disappearance for this video, and with it being such a long time ago, I highly doubt that I'd be able to find such a wealth of information as I was able to with William and Luke, but I may have to give it a go at some point. So a year later now, on the 11th of April 2016, the family, with Luke, actually travelled back to the very site Luke disappeared from. Now I know some people might think they were absolutely crazy for doing that, but it can actually be quite therapeutic to face trauma like this, so I can understand what they were doing here. This time though, Luke was wearing a GPS navigator, thank god. 
So his mother stated, Luke coped fairly well going back to the scene, but became more concerned at night and didn't want to leave the immediate area where we were camping. Okay, so that's pretty much the end of the land now, in terms of reporting as far as I can tell. Uh, except Luke received a Pride of Australia award, which I was really chuffed about. I normally don't like doing this, and obviously I don't know what happened, but I really do think that there's more to this incident than we'll ever know about, because I don't think Luke's ever going to be able to express it. It really does seem as though something unusual happened here, uh, and I couldn't explain to you what, but something just feels very off about this one. But yeah, other than that, I'm going to have to end this one here, so do share your thoughts. I do read all of the comments by the way, so do keep them coming. And finally, I'd just like to say a special thank you to my Patreon members who are really helping me sustain the research on these missing people. If you like the work that I do on the channel and you want to help support it, then you can find a link to that in the description below. And thank you very much for watching. I hope that you've had a nice day or evening, depending on where you are. And uh, yeah, apart from that, stay safe, guys, and I will see you next time. Cheers.